Hello traders, welcome to our weekly discussion about the fundamental themes and scheduled event risk that can move our markets and potentially generate a significant opportunity, but also, uh, and you should look at it on both sides, just like we look at leverage, uh, create a significant amount of risk that we want to be mindful of. Uh, as always, we're just here to hit upon the major themes and perhaps some of the dark horses of potential volatility. Uh, so we'll try to cover the big picture stuff. I won't get everything isn't enough time for it, but uh, with this conversation, at least you should have a better uh, understanding about what particular to look out for, uh, and this is particularly useful if you're a technical uh, primary trader. But as always, if you could just give me a heads up, a why, yes, uh, just so that I know everything is working A-OK -okay on the audio and visual. Uh, currently, I'm looking at the Euro USD, and if that is indeed the case, then we'll dive right into it. All right, thank you, everyone. Okay, so the first place we're looking here is the Euro USD. Uh, it makes sense. This is the most liquid of uh, the currency pairs in the world. It also happens to be one of the most liquid assets in the world if we treat it as a uh, asset. Uh, you can see the progress that this has made in 2017. It, it just so happens that the very beginning of the year happens to be the low that we've set in this entire uh, range that we've produced so far. Today happens to be the very high of this range for that period. In percentage terms, this is very impressive. All right, 14 plus percent for the euro USD moves to the upside. That is extraordinary for something like an exchange rate, especially one of this liquidity. So there's no denying that this actually has uh, girth to it, fundamental backing and conviction. But it doesn't necessarily mean that there's enough conviction to keep it running, uh, because even though there seem to be uh, trends that we can point to, uh, these persistent uh, bearings from the market or a trend uh, are atypical. All right? The exclusions are certainly uh, coming with particular uh, secondary effects that make them very suspicious and not uh, at all the norm. All right? Not healthy trends, most of these. But this is very much a, uh, an impressive persistent move. You can see the appreciation now brings us to a high that we haven't seen in two and a half years. All right? And at the center of this is not just factors for the euro and the dollar. This is a statement on the financial system. This is a statement on FX in general. Uh, it tells us how sentiment is performing, how monetary policy is playing out, what its relative appeal is, uh, and other aspects like this that seem much larger than just this exchange rate itself, which it is. Uh, so this is a great uh, fundamental way post for most traders, right? for m myself included. And from it, we can take a lot of uh, a lot of analysis that can be utilized for things like the yen crosses, or uh, over in treasuries, or even in equities as a risk basis for uh, how monetary policy is influencing sentiment. Yes, this particular pair can't speak to all those uh, perspectives. Now, the performance that we're getting from the Euro USD speaks to a number of these big picture themes. Uh, but this past week, the top scheduled event risk on the docket was the FOMC rate decision. All right, why? Because it, it really hones in on what the market most focuses in on, uh, which is relative monetary policy, but more so than just relative monetary policy to say the dollar is rising or falling against its major counterparts because of you know, an accelerated pace of rate hikes or the massive side of its balance sheet or something along those lines, we're increasingly seeing that the collective view of monetary policy, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add an average in here. Um, the collective view of monetary policy is increasingly being put up against the measure of how healthy are the markets, how acclimated are they, how uh, independent and self-sustainable are they against the backdrop of massive amounts of stimulus and uh, years of central bank backing for stability, knowing that they're starting to collectively turn this corner. And they are c turning this corner. The Fed and the Bank of Canada have already hiked rates, but there is evidence that the ECB is going to put a pin in its QE program and start plotting its normalization of policy. The RBA and the uh, RBNZ, two of the high yield currencies, are, are 
predicted to uh, lift rates relatively soon. Uh, whether that has traction or not from the central banker's perspective, the market's are already pricing it in. Uh, and then we have uh, even the Bank of, of England, and uh, they're uh, waffling back and forth on whether to change monetary policy to be uh, outright hawkish, not lifting rates, but uh, promising that their next move is going to be hawkish. So this is a collective view, that the Fed just sits at the very extreme end of this spectrum. And this is increasingly coming into traders' focus, uh, where many people previously were perhaps just riding the uh, riding the trend on something like the S&P 500, or they were uh, they were willing to buy into the complacency because they would say that well this time is different earnings, dividends, etc. Uh, increasingly, we've gotten to the point where it's clear that we're not really operating with a reasonable assumption of the traditional or acad academic interpretations of fundamentals. So we're not talking about, well, this is just reflecting great growth potential. That's why the S&P 500 is charging to new record highs. Um, and even uh, short-term situations like the confidence built into uh, what they call the Trump rally, which is essentially belief that the uh, growth-oriented policies that have been promised by the uh, Trump administration are starting to flag a little bit in terms of confidence, but uh, those were used as justification for the next phase higher. Inevitably, traders or investors were just looking for a reason to uh, maintain their already considerable exposure or add to it, uh, and they, they happened upon uh, confidence in tax reform and infrastructure spending. But would that have been enough, even if realized, to really uh, promote and justify where we currently are in the markets, uh, looking at the historical context of what value represents. Uh, I would argue no, uh, but that is the foundation of complacency. We look for things that actually reinforce our views. So this relative monetary policy turns into a collective monetary policy and it's something that is being highlighted on a global basis and at the very center of it is what the Fed represents. It's already one that moved and it's guiding other central banks to start to contemplate their own uh, withdrawal from exceptional uh, easing efforts. And that is dangerous because it does expose uh, something that many now, essentially all the major central banks, at least one of their members, have suggested that uh, the depths of complacency that we've experienced are uh, encouraging a reach for risky positioning. And eventually we're going to highlight that fact. If the markets start to pull back, uh, we'll see the quality of the investors behind this. Now, of course, there are thousands of different types of traders with different uh, interpretations of what risk reward is and where their pressure points are to say I'm going to start getting out um, but collectively they are more of the speculative mindset they're looking for momentum taking advantage of momentum buy low sell high mentality they're not getting in here and now or have gotten in recently with the assumption that we are at seeing great value here and now just taking advantage of conditions and when you take advantage of conditions and you're just looking for momentum, your tolerance for markets just hanging out, stalling, uh, or riding a drawdown is much lower. So this FOMC rate decision this past week uh, speaks into that big picture fundamental interpretation. And what the Fed did was essentially walk the exact line we expect from it. It would uh, introduce no changes to its monetary policy because, generally speaking, it's outside of their their, pa their pace. They've been moving every quarter uh, for the past three quarters, and obviously they also did one in December, 15, uh, December 2015. Uh, so four rate hikes. They're talking about the implementation of the QE program being, quote-unquote, relatively soon. That's what we took away from the policy statement. And if we held up the pace, they would uh, potentially move in September. Although, looking at the Fed funds futures for September, there is not a lot of confidence that they're going to hike rates. Uh, as of Friday, it was uh, pricing at about a 5% probability that they'll hike in September. 
So that would more likely lead to December, although there too the markets are a little bit skeptical, actually a lot skeptical. The general probability that they're going to hike again by the end of this year is about 42%. So very, very reticent uh, to believe that the Fed is going to be able to maintain this path of tightening. And to a certain extent, some of the dollar's struggles are wrapped up in this. Because we know that the dollar having, uh, since really in, in 2014, 2015 especially, uh, has built up a premium, a head of premium, if you will, uh, that was anticipating that they were going to be a first mover status. So they would have a slight yield advantage, but it's a yield advantage nonetheless, and that would draw people in to invest into U.S.-based assets. And it was a buy the rumor situation. Now that we're actually realizing the rate hikes, and the first one, just for reference, started right here. Since we started rate hikes, and now we start the conversation about uh, normalizing or selling uh, assets off the balance sheet, uh, we've really not marked major progress. Although we haven't really pulled back either in a meaningful way. It's just, uh, there's a difference between fairly pricing in the assumption that the Fed is going to be a first mover and a slow path of appreciation or, or of interest rate hikes and withdrawal of uh, aggressive stimulus. And then there's also the, uh, there's the other side of this that traders have just gone too far. They just absolutely were reaching for the dollar and U.S.-based assets because it was the only option and they were motivated by absolute complacency and a desperate need for yield or capital gains in a, anticipation of yield. W which side of the coin does this fall? Did the dollar rise too far against the backdrop that they were going to be the first mover of four rate hikes before even the, uh, the first or the second, uh, second place rate decision or rate hike was implemented, which was from the Bank of Canada? Or um, is it uh, simply fairly valued? And I don't think we can answer that, not until we see the markets weigh out their expectations. And it's not just going to be the dollar that is uh, party to this conversation and this interpretation. The dollar itself can't set its own value. Yeah, we like to think it does, but this is not like a stock where this, you know, this is not, this is not uh, well, let's use a, a credible uh, comparison. This is not Apple shares. It can't uh, derive its value out of the blue. It has to have context. And that, those are those uh, major counterpart currencies. Although, to be fair, Apple really isn't going to be able to uh, maintain at least a deviation from tech sector, from the overall performance of equity markets, from the U.S. economy. It needs these contexts to actually place value. Same with the dollar. Um, but in the dollar's uh, realm, it is really looking at the counterparts, all right? And one of the best performing counterparts is the euro, the second most liquid currency in the world. And it has been picking up as well because, one, it has been steeply devalued, especially from the 2014 tumble uh, at 140, which was in part a threat by the ECB. It's, it's always good to remember what motivated the first leg down if you're trying to plot or evaluate correction versus uh, reversal. What motivated the euro USD to drop from 140 back in 2014? It was the ECB's express threat that they would implement monetary policy to ensure that the euro did not appreciate further than 140. They didn't, in exacting language, say 140 euro USD cannot go above. But they, it was as explicit as you can get from a central banker's perspective. This is why uh, when there are other policy authorities around the world that kind of harp on, let's say, the Bank of Japan or the Swiss National Bank uh, or other major institutions for saying that they're manipulating exchange rate with their, uh, via their monetary policy. No one did it in larger scale than the ECB, but yet they rarely get blamed. Why? Because they're the second largest in the world, so no one's going to say anything. But this indeed uh, was the motivation that uh, really tipped off the euro USD's tumble and added to the dollar's strength. Obviously, that was happening at the same time that the Fed was uh, gearing up for its first rate hike and really ramping up its language uh, related to tightening. But 
if the euro hadn't dropped aggressively because of that threat by the ECB, the dollar's gains wouldn't have been that strong. So that added to this. All right. But that also is a reason to believe, all right, well, if that was the drop that we got anticipation of the ECB uh, announcing QE, which actually happened back here in March of 2015, so uh, we stall, we had already run our course by that time, uh, and uh, amid uh, or in anticipation of multiple further rate cuts and negative rates. All right, so we priced all that and we discounted it to presumably a very low level or low value at that point. But now what is the conversation? Now the conversation is, uh, well, we've done uh, a lot. We're starting to see a diminished return or effectiveness of monetary policy. And uh, we're starting to discuss uh, loosely the uh, the change in tact that we're going to take if we, uh, when we start to get the end of this uh, QE program, which can be uh, sometime in 2018, it seems. If that was the motivation for the way down, this certainly stands to the test of what would be motivation for reversal. So we start to look at this going back up, and if you evaluate what motivated it lower, you can assess that, yes, there is good reason that this is lifting. The question then becomes, all right, what's fair value in these circumstances? Uh, the ECB's uh, timetable is not that aggressive. Their conviction is kind of shaky, uh, to be expected. Uh, and the threats that they face is very, very significant. But this particular pair can define what happens to the dollar, can define what happens to the euro, but also a statement to, all right, well, the ECB's in this course uh, and this shift in monetary policy expectations, what does that mean for the Japanese yen, who is arguably the most aggressive of the uh, dovish monetary policy authorities? What does that mean for the RBA and the RBNZ, which falls somewhere in between, and really they're not to the liquidity scale that either of these currencies is, uh, and their position in the spectrum is really, uh, really highlighted by the fact that they offer a higher yield than most others. So what is the Aussie and the Kiwi going to do in this spectrum? All right, this is really, uh, really working through uh, your personal understanding and your personal beliefs for the EURUSD can have serious um, fundamental benefits to evaluating all other uh, major exchange rates as well as some of the miners too. So this is the fundamental shift that we're getting, and this is going to carry over from week to week so long as this remains the dominant theme. How would this be removed from being the dominant theme? If the, if the S&P 500 were to just absolutely collapse uh, and VIX surge, which would indicate to me that risk aversion is kicking in in a very serious way, then we temporarily ignore things like who has a slight yield advantage and where is the, the nuanced uh, fair value of a monetary policy scheme in this broader spectrum. It still matters, it just matters a lot less in the realm of full-scale risk aversion. I actually did a video recently that says, all right, what happens in full-scale risk aversion um, from a variety of assets, including the dollar and gold and Bitcoin. Um, you can see that in my, uh, in my listings of videos. But I wanted to bring that back because I don't want us to lose sight of, yes, this is uh, something, a scenario that we should be prepared for because in the midst of that high profile volatile market movement, we need a plan. We need to already have thought that through because in the heat of the moment, all right, if you have not prepared, it is just going to fall apart. All right, it's like going into any professional competition without having practiced or going up and delivering a speech without having practiced. You need to have thought it through. You need to have worked it out. So, Risk trends is something that can override all other, but in the meantime, we still are operating with this monetary policy relative and monetary policy collective view uh, in, in price action, especially in the FX market. And that's going to be true this week, uh, although we don't have a FOMC. We don't have the ECB that was uh, before the FOMC rate decision. Uh, this week, we're going to be looking at two other major central banks, which they are very important. The RBA 
And on Thursday, which we call Super Thursday, is the Bank of England rate decision. Now, these are important for the Australian dollar and the Bank of England, or sorry, the British pound, no doubt, but they're also very important for the collective. Just uh, the broader assessment of where is monetary policy overall uh, and what can that do to the perception of low risk and an absolute appetite for yield and return. So this is the purple line's total stimulus by the major central banks versus the S&P 500. And this is total stimulus by the central banks uh, overlaid with the VIX volatility index. All right, so just to give you context, these two central banks generally sit in the middle all right, of the spectrum. They have not been actively moving monetary policy for uh, a little while now, almost a year, uh, and they have both uh, essentially backed off of their easing uh, warnings and have only tentatively changed their language to suggest that the next move can more likely be a hike rather than a cut. All right, but they have not fully committed to that. So these are very much the balancing point. Right? They, they are the middle of the fulcrum. And if you shift weight eventually, uh, too much weight to one side, the market start to respond to that. If you, if you shift too much of the central banks to the hawkish side, the reality that central banks are starting to tighten and remove their uh, uh, aggressive accommodation is going to start to sink in to everyone. And then they have to really evaluate, am I confident enough to hold on to this exposure? Let's say I, I got in three days ago uh, just off of record highs on the S&P 500 and you know, I look at traditional measures like dividend forecasts, uh, benchmark yield forecasts, uh, cost opportunity, you know, earnings per share uh, projections, things like that. And is it worth me sitting in knowing that these central banks are taking back their support? They're, they're, for, they're rolling back up the safety net slowly. You might in, initially, but eventually at some point you'll look down, you'll notice the height, and you're going to start to really second guess uh, being up on that uh, tightrope. And it can happen with the Bank of England, it can happen with the RBA, it might have to wait until the ECB. It's very difficult to, to tell in a, in a mass setting where there are thousands upon thousands of traders who individually have to make their assessment for their own risk balance, their own um, acceptance level of risk to say this is it, this is the, this is the point where I have to get out, this is, this is too rich for my blood. Usually when the markets are very one-sided too, you have the risk of avalanche for those that uh, go skiing or snowboarding out in freshly laid powder after very heavy dumps. Uh, you don't want to go far off the trails because avalanches are very easy to set off. So it's the same kind of uh, general concept. You have to be very mindful of what you are traversing in terms of market terrain. Now. These two rate decisions, between the two of them, I would put greater emphasis on the Bank of England, simply because it is a much larger central bank and its economy is significantly larger. So if the perception that they are outright hawkish uh, comes across the wires, it would have more significant impact than the Australian central bank, the Reserve Bank of Australia, as being more hawkish. Because Australia is not really going to uh, fully tip the scales, although it could, it's just less likely to do so. All right, you're not going to get Europeans necessarily running for the hills and uh, Japanese running for the hills because Australia decided to hike rates or indicate that they're going to be willing to hike rates. But if the Bank of England did, that is a far more uh, likely scenario. So first, though, the RBA rate decision, since it is chronological, uh, we're talking here about a currency in which, in large part, it's considered one of the majors because of its exceptionally high yield. Relatively large economy, but uh, it really doesn't get to the, anywhere close to the scale of a U.S. or China or U.K. or Japan or uh, Eurozone. So it's in this spectrum because of its high yield and high credit rating. But that is very important because it also tells us, all right, what is my, what's the upper threshold of my expected returns? A chart that I, I, I almost insist on uh, visiting almost every time 
is the S&P 500 versus what I consider to be a, a baseline for returns. This is the 10-year government bond yields of the G10 collective. So this is about the base of return that you can expect. Yeah, you can get a you can get a differential. Uh, you can get a higher return depending on what assets you choose, because very 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 few of you are probably taking government bond yields or government bonds of medium duration. But this is your baseline for return. This is the S and P 500, the dark blue line. That's that's what you pay to get into the market. You're paying a lot to re to receive a little. And how long will we be accepting of this? At what point do we start to say, no, this is too much risk, or I paid too much? These will meet in the middle somewhere at some point, uh, but <laughs> which of these two is more likely to move quickly? Cost usually falls much faster than return picks up. So just a little caution there. But the RBA and the RBNZ, for that matter, as well, are essentially, they define this part of, the, uh, of this assessment in, for currency markets. They are the high yield or high dividend. This is the most uh, remarkable return that we can expect amongst the major currencies. The dollar has done a lot under the Fed to catch up and to build up a premium. Uh, it has substantial premium versus the euro and the yen uh, and even the British pound, uh, but it is still short of the Australian New Zealand benchmark returns. So these are the, this is essentially the max return you can expect amongst the majors. And they define for us how much premium we put on the value of these currencies or in the currency market according to how much return we can expect. Now, there is also a strategic issue here for RBA and RBNZ, which is the New Zealand Central Bank, uh, leadership to consider. If the Fed laps me and essentially has a higher yield than I do, do I significantly start to see my position in the global spectrum diminish? Because one of the selling points of my, uh, my local assets is that it has a higher resting yield or higher resting return than these more liquid countries, kind of like how, you know, a blue chip stock or blue chip debt, like a, a corporate bond, um, has a higher rate of return than a government bond or a high yield uh, fixed income has a higher return than a, a blue chip bond. All right, so there's a question of premium here, but if the really safe and really liquid uh, presum presumed currency like the dollar has a higher return than my higher risk, higher return previously uh, currency and, and investments, then what's the purpose of even going to that unless there's a major discount in price? So those people that have some training in fixed income, this is this, this price yield conversation is is a familiar one, but for many others it, it doesn't. Uh, it's still somewhat abstract. But the RBA tells us how much value is put upon this and where our high end yield is, and it would really upend uh, the spectrum of risk in the FX market if the Fed continued to tighten rates while the RBA and the RBNs you just sat there keeping their rates unchanged as the, the Fed benchmark rate overtook it. It would really change the perspective of currency, uh, currency crosses like the Aussie USD. At that point, the Australian dollar is not the uh, carry currency, high yield currency. That would be going to the dollar, the US dollar, which would be very unusual. And would also raise the question of, all right, in, in the event of risk aversion, all right, where do I go? Where is your uh, crash position? Do you go into the U.S. dollar because that's a, that has the greater liquidity, or does the market advance an Aussie dollar advance against its U.S. counterpart because you're still uh, sitting in a discount? That's actually the argument for why the Japanese yen is often treated as a safe haven currency. It is not safe haven. It, people don't just go and park their capital in Japan in mass uh, when markets start to uh, sees they are just taking off carry trades 
which means I'm taking off a long Aussie or Kiwi or dollar position and I'm going back into the Japanese yen which I used to facilitate this position to begin with. I went long Aussie yen for example and that's to collect carry. When you have risk aversion you take the carry trade off. So you were long Aussie short yen to reverse that trade you go short Aussie long yen. So the yen picks up but not by virtue of it being an absolute safe haven. So it, it's very important to distinguish that because I've seen people get into a trade with this, especially a, a, a yen based crosses but it happens too, uh, too because of uh, or on these Aussie and Kiwi crosses for example where people just think that there, there's going to be a trend that arises and uh, or that fundamentals have been uh, completely reset and then they're they're taken uh, by surprise because the, their assumptions of a new a new world order have been just completely dashed when we revert back to the norm so we have to know that this is kind of a there's a temporary factor here that in the first phase of risk aversion uh, currencies like the dollar are going to get hurt because it's been treated as a carry currency versus let's say a euro but if sentiment really starts to fall apart the euro USD is going to drop because people are going to move their capital to the US because the strain is going to be better handled there. All right. Now the Aussie dollar, I mean, if we got full-scale risk aversion, the dollar would pick up very readily. Um, but in the interim, yes, a, a pullback of yield or carry could hurt the dollar. Uh, but at this point, having broken above 78.50, I don't know if we necessarily have that uh, that massive dollar premium. I don't think the Aussie dollar is necessarily sitting on a uh, just a extreme uh, discount, and thereby would naturally revert to that. So the next move is going to increasingly be dependent upon what the RBA says and does. Now, most likely, the central bank is going to issue no change. All right, that's the leading consensus. But look at their statement. And there's also going to be a late, uh, monetary policy statement that comes out a couple days later. Uh, read the statement. We want to see what their convictions are. If they start to talk about raising rates, and they will use economic justification, but there's also that strategy behind it. Can't get too far behind because if the U.S. starts to lap us, we're, we're in a pro we have a problem. But this is going to really, on a speculative basis, start looking forward. Just like the euro is starting to rise and has been rising throughout 2017, despite the fact that they're still uh, engaged in massive stimulus effort, and why the dollar rallied in 2014, well before they actually hiked rates, um, the Fed, this is also a forward-looking con condition. And right now, markets are relatively stable. There's no full-scale risk aversion, uh, and we're still uh, reaching and stretching for rates of return. So the, the, the forward-looking mentality is still very strong. When markets are relatively steady, our projection uh, time frame gets longer and longer and longer. I'm willing to look further and further out for my returns because everything seems steady, stable. Low volatility means I can really reach for that, that yield, in other words. So this is going to be very important to really define the upper bound of risk reward. I want to see exactly how much return I can expect and start to see this pick up. And that can, that's a profound statement, not just for the Aussie dollar, obviously. There's good potential there for the Aussie dollar. It needs justification. It needs uh, a backdrop to really continue to advance. And to look again, something like the Aussie CAD, it needs something to fortify uh, from seeing the Aussie CAD break lower because the Bank of Canada has already moved. And recently, with their uh, their GDP figures last week, uh, there's certainly stronger motivation for speculating that the Bank of uh, Bank of Canada is going to move faster. All right, so it needs that to kind of. Uh, level out and the Aussie yen which is starting to see a pullback I mean if you look at a four-hour chart of the Aussie yen it looks like a channel break to the downside within a larger wedge pattern if it wants to continue higher you got you have to f facilitate the expectations of higher return and really motivate the Aussie dollar to continue to rally all right so the RBA's rhetoric is going to be used for this and I, I know so many people will say, oh, well, I'm not watching the central bank rate decision because the leading expectation is no change. Well, again, I, I defer to the dollar index weekly chart. If you just waited uh, to trade anything dollar until the Fed actually were moving, you would have waited all the way up until here. 
you would have missed all of that. Why? Because the market's forward-looking. We have to appreciate the fact that they're forward-looking, and speculation projects forward, not just through technicals. They project forward through fundamentals. Too many times I've seen technicals used as kind of a crutch because the, the, the person just doesn't know uh, what to look for on the fundamental side. And they don't understand what they're getting into, so they just they f fully commit to technicals and just say, All right, wherever momentum stops and however many technical uh, resistance or support levels we breach, I just keep in on it. And it really is just losing touch with the fundamental arguments and what would motivate the crowd. We're just trying to look to see what motivates this crowd. So the Aussie dollar is at the, f the very beginning of this, where the euro has really been taking advantage in 2017 because it's a, it's a bigger player. It's more, it, it really carries much more weight. So it draws more speculation. But the RBA is at the beginning of this, and so is, to, to, that, uh, to that extent, the RBNZ, the New Zealand dollar. But they don't have a rate decision this week, so they can't really... Um, they can't really redefine their, their bearings at this point. So I'm going to be watching this for the Aussie dollar. There are a number of currency crosses that can actually benefit depending on whether the RBA is more or less hawkish. If they're more hawkish, something like the Aussie USD looks good. Um, if they're less hawkish, then something like the Aussie yen looks good. All right. But this also has deeper influence when we're looking at the big picture risk interpretation. But of the two central banks that are due to uh, deliberate on monetary policy this week, the Bank of England carries far more weight as being one of the larger central banks. They are, uh, well, for a general assessment, they are slightly to the right of my neutral standing, meaning they're slightly hawkish. Um, that might be a little bit generous, but this is a relative spectrum. The Fed is at the top end of my hawkish scale because uh, it, it is relative. Somebody has to be at the low end, somebody has to be at the high end, and right now the, the bank at the high end is moving once a quarter and 25 basis point increments. That's not particularly hawkish historically speaking, but compared to everyone else, it is. All right, so that's our milestone, that's our benchmark. In that benchmark, the Bank of England is slightly in the hawkish category. Now, they have been very active over the past year, whereas many others have not. They've taken very deliberate, slow, uh, and uh, or forward guidance-based movements. They've tried to reduce volatility. They've not made uh, dramatic changes. They've slowly introduced things, even the Fed has given us a lot of warning well ahead of time, hence why the dollar rallied well before these, these efforts have been put into play. But the Bank of England has been less clear on its motivations because it has been back, going back and forth. Brexit was obviously a big un, uh, unknown component of that, uh, so they've had to kind of turn very quickly. Uh, now, when it comes to the uh, monetary policy uh, decision that they're making, uh, we've had, well, last meeting, the MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England, had three dissenters. One of those dissenters has retired and been replaced, so uh, now we only have two dissenters from the old, uh, or from last meeting. Uh, but the circumstances are still uh, pressuring this monetary policy authority. And some of the people that voted for no change last time still had or struck a hawkish tone. Like Mark Carney, who's go, who goes seemingly back and forth. Um, and where Mark Carney goes, most likely the entire Bank of England goes. And his back and forth and view really start to complicate what happens with the British pound uh, under the Bank of England's guidance. Now this happens to be what we call, that they call a Super Thursday because it's not just a rate decision. Uh, this, the, more, the most likely outcome from this Bank of England rate decision is no change. Uh, but this is particularly uh, good at fueling speculation because the forward guidance component of this event is much more in-depth. Much like the Fed's uh, quarterly monetary policy uh, events where they produce forecasts for yield and growth and, and all those other uh, measures as well as Janet Yellen's press conference. This is 
it's the Super Thursday where we have not just a banking and rate decision, we have that quarterly inflation report, which is their equivalency of the SEP from the Fed, this, this our economic projections, and this is where we're going to get our speculation from. If they start to come out with a very uh, a more hawkish tone, uh, very clearly uh, kind of setting up the market for an inevitable rate hike, then it's going to be seen. The markets are not going to miss that because they are, uh, their radars are on high alert right now. Uh, and it can have a very significant impact on the pound. That's not, this is not as easy because the pound also has a secondary interest uh, which also often uh, gets to the forefront and that is uh, how is the Brexit progressing? Is it better for the, or worse than the pound? Right now the sterling is still very much discounted uh, for the uh, decision, the vote back on June 23rd, uh, 2016 to withdraw from the EU. All right, you can see that's the high of the range, this is the low range, that actually happened to be a mid of flash crash for the sterling, and we just uh, recently crossed the 38.2 fib of that, which is about 131. So we're still in a significant discount, and the discount is measured not because, oh, this is going to completely ravage the UK economy and the financial markets are, and financial assets within the UK have no hope. It's none of that. It's just we don't know what the outcome is going to be. It's very uncertain. We can't establish how deep uh, these developments can uh, upset the normal fundamental order, the financial order. And until we start to clear up some of this uncertainty, the sterling is going to be very reticent uh, to make a significant move. Yet, if the Bank of England were to start to say, and were to say explicitly Thursday that, oh, but we're going to start hiking rates as of if they move Thursday, it certainly would uh, leverage a rally from the sterling. But if they were to make clear that they're going to start on a pace of rate hikes going forward, the sterling would advance. The Brexit uncertainties would still be there, but you would really cater to what has been motivating the markets. A forecast for return or yield, as which we're just trying to take advantage of uh, slow money uh, coming in and lifting a market slowly, and speculators are just trying to get in front of that. They're riding the waves of uh, fundamentals. So if we started to see very explicitly that that shift has uh, inc been incurred, uh, this would be something that would is not fully appreciated and fully priced in. So yes, the sterling would advance. There would be that haze of uncertainty related to Brexit, but investors and traders would be a little bit more willing to uh, put it to the wayside as they cover some of the discount. All right. So. This is, again, very unique for the British pound and has significant implications, but it also is kind of a barometer. It's a gauge of how much can monetary policy uh, influence in terms of risk on, risk off, or you know, the return to be expected and the forward-looking nature of the market versus uh, the focus on things like risk trends and Brexit, all right, competing major fundamental themes. It can be tough to really evaluate on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, I know this because I have to try to, I have to attempt to do this and look for evidence of this. But it can be very difficult to say, all right, today's trades should be based on monetary policy rather than risk trends, or vice versa. It's not easy to evaluate. If I'm uh, if I'm leveling up a, a euro pound view, I'm saying, all right, what what can motivate this for a break? Or I, I'm, I've been a little bit more interested in the pound kiwi. What can motivate a, a, a pound kiwi resolution to this congestion? a short-term break from this recent range. What can force that 174 or 176 break and what would keep it going? Should I be looking at um, risk trends and carry trade appeal? Should I be looking at uh, secondary uh, data, economic data? Should I be looking at relative monetary policy between the Bank of England's lean versus the RBNZ's lean? And if I'm really looking at carry trade appeal, the New Zealand dollar has a far greater sitting, resting yield than the British pound although historically the yield differential behind them is extremely small. So it really depends on how, how much appetite there is for that carry trade. All right. I have to be able to establish what is motivating the most people, what is motivating thereby the market. Because if I can't establish that, how can I reasonably project a, a move with follow-through? I can't. So it's always the question in fundamentals about what has the greatest influence over the market. And 
putting greater emphasis, greater weight on that particular theme. All right, so these two rate decisions speak to a deeper interest in the market. And there's certainly a lot more event risk out there, but this is what really is speaking to the theme that has recently dominated and has the greater potential of actually moving the markets, not just those individual currencies, but also uh, getting that shift in the underlying current. Some of the other fundamental uh, developments that we need to watch going forward. Uh, already we had some interesting event risk. Uh, none of it really spoke to big movements. I saw a lot of emphasis put on the Chinese PMIs. I don't think they were that market moving, however. The BOJ uh, announced its uh, bond purchase program for August or its intentions. Uh, not really surprised. Economic data from Eurozone, important to measure milestones, economic milestones, but not really a big market mover. Uh, emerging markets aren't even going to tally up at this point. Uh, we're going to get a lot more PMIs uh, throughout the, the week, more the first readings from service sector, but uh, plenty of it. Uh, we're going to have the German employment and UK PMI figures, which are noteworthy, and if there's enough surprise, they can be market moving. The Eurozone GDP uh, has absolutely the potential of being market moving but it has to surprise and that's difficult to do uh, given that many of the component uh, economy GDP figures are already known. Uh, the Fed's favored inflation figure is coming out uh, tomorrow, All right, the PCE deflator, but our assumptions have already been set and reticence and, and skepticism about the Fed's ability to hike in 2017 has already been ingrained after last week's FOMC rate decision, so it'll be tough to move the needle through this. The Apple uh, second quarter earnings, I mean, there's tons of earnings throughout this entire week, but this is the world's largest uh, company by market cap, so this carries a little bit more weight on that front. Uh, this actually has good potential of being market moving specifically for the New Zealand dollar uh, because uh, getting these concentrated moves can offer some short-term opportunities, and short-term opportunities nowadays, given the lack of consistency of the dominant fundamental themes, uh, it really puts emphasis on short-term opportunities, and this is one that can do so. Uh, we'll have some Fed speak, the uh, so-called appetizer to non-farm payrolls, uh, the ADP employment statistics, uh, then we have uh, some PMI figures and obviously the BOE, uh, and then Friday we get the non-farm payrolls, which don't overemphasize because I don't think this will move the needle on the Fed either, and unless it moves the needle on U.S. monetary policy expectations, uh, it's probably not going to carry significant weight otherwise. Why? Because what are the other things that can actually move? Risk trends itself, which is a very deep pool. All right, think of, uh, think about trying to cause a wave in a, a standing body of, of uh, water. Uh, if you drop in a big rock into a puddle, yeah, the water's going to be it's going to be moving aggressively. Um, but the deeper the, the pool is, the less impact that that stone uh, actually has. And risk trends is the deepest. It is tough to motivate, but once it gets going, it really has uh, influence and can just override the entire market. So it's not going to be risk trends that this necessarily triggers. It's more likely to be monetary policy, but We've seen the skepticism really calcify uh, in expectations for what the Fed's going to do next. Uh, it could also have an impact on just basic economic expectations, but those have not been very productive in moving the markets either. So I wouldn't put my, put my anticipation there. But again, uh, if you're looking for a concentrated uh, short-term currency-specific impact, uh, the combination of the Canadian employment figures and trade balance can certainly move the markets. We've seen actually the Canadian employment statistics in, in particular have proven one of the more market moving of the employment data uh, out there uh, under surprise, of course. Can't just move markets if it's you know right on. Uh, that and the Aussie employment statistics are arguably the most effective at generating short-term volatility. So keep an eye on that just in case if you have any uh, particular CAD ambitions. So dictating and understanding the, the major fundamental theme from the market is your first step, and right now it's still monetary policy, but we're getting from monetary policy into the construct of, all right, how is this policy versus how is this policy into the collective view.
of how a general shift towards easing is starting to influence risk taking in all assets. And if we make that shift, that is a very significant opportunity in terms of uh, the trade opportunities that arise. All right. So evaluate what you think is the uh, primary concern. Uh, you might disagree with me, that's fine. Look for that fundamental theme that you ha think has the greatest potential. Or uh, if you want to just avoid these big ticket themes and look at the short-term opportunities uh, centered on major event risk, uh, which has limited duration, but uh, more intensity like a Canadian employment figure, uh, trade around that. But I encourage you to try both. And as I, I frequently say now, uh, when you sign up for these webinars, you, you get a demo account. So open that demo account try it out. Um, try to place the short-term view trades and try to also evaluate your, your, your confidence and understanding what the medium-term themes and long-term themes are. Um, if you are, as most people are, uh, focused on one time frame in particular and you do most of your trading in that time frame, attempt the other side. Try to become more fluid in the entire span of time frame and the understanding of what kind of markets you're in. Because that gets into technicals, that gets into fundamentals, that gets into conditional analysis, and you get a much better uh, appreciation, understanding, and uh, that you boost the probabilities of your trades. All right, so open up that demo account. Uh, you don't have to go into the live account and you know start to really pull a bunch of levers all at once. Go into the demo account and and a practice account and just uh, try out these things until you get your footing. And then once you see that they help, then incorporating into your live trading. All right. All right, we'll wrap it up here. I'm going to attempt to do my Q&A tomorrow, but I might be out, so I'll give ample heads up if that is indeed the case. Hopefully I get to see you, though, tomorrow, and we get to talk, and I get to answer all the trading, marketing, and strategy questions that you might have. Uh, so until we speak again, I wish you good luck trading out there.